our mission is really about bringing forward those therapies to patients. We have an amazing set of clinicians, researchers, bioengineers, bioethicists, and scholars who all make up the Stem Cell Network. It's a really wonderful community. Welcome to NGB Ideas, a podcast about the personal journey of leaders, innovators, and disruptors in the Canadian life sciences community. I'm Jim Wilson, and our guest this week is Kate Murray, who is president and CEO of the Stem Cell Network in Ottawa. This organization is a Canadian not-for-profit that supports three main objectives. First, stem cell and regenerative medicine research. Secondly, training the next generation of researchers. And lastly, supporting and sharing research in this incredible field. SCN was created in 2001 with support from the federal government and the network has grown from a few dozen labs to include more than 270 world-class research groups and dozens of clinical trials. Before we get to our conversation with Kate, we'd like to thank the TMX Group and the Hamilton Health Sciences Foundation for their support. We would also like to thank our major sponsors that include Admari Bioinnovations, Omniabio, Bay Area Health Trust, Eurofins CDMO Alfora, Nova Nordisk, X Design, and Lab Occupier. This episode was recorded in August 2023. Kate Murray, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you. Well, it's really wonderful to be here. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Let's jump in. I understand you were born in Peterborough, Ontario, but your family moved around quite a bit in your early years because of your father's job. What did your father do? My father was an Anglican minister. His job with the church at that time, this was the early 70s into the 80s, he was responsible for going and supporting churches that were in crisis for one reason or another. That had us traveling a fair bit. Then he got out of the church So my dad decided to start his own company and to do marriage and family therapy and addictions counseling. He took a huge risk, actually. He left the church with three children. My mom was a stay-at-home mom taking care of us, and he had $300 in his pocket. And off he went and started up his own business. And decades later, it was still going strong. So it sounds like you were living the, uh, perhaps the religious equivalent of a military family life, moving from one place to the next. That must have been relatively tough on some level. I don't think it was as tough or as demanding as the military families. In our situation, by the time I had come along, he was at a point in his career where they had placed him in Aurora at a place called the Anglican Conference Center. This was our spot. So this is where we lived, and he went out to churches that were in the area, whether it was Holland Landing or King City or Stouffville, even in Aurora, like he was moving around and supporting in that space. Today, the conference center's gone. St. Andrew's College bought the land, and they built St. Anne's. It's amazing to see how that land in that area has changed since I was a little girl playing in the pond and climbing the hills. So when you were living and growing up in Aurora, it was more of a farming community. And for those listeners who may not be familiar with the greater Toronto area, all due respect to people who live in Aurora, it's a bedroom community to a very great degree for Toronto in the northern region of the GTA. When you were growing up, were you on a farm or were you in a neighborhood? The conference center was located on 75 acres of land. So really amazing place to grow up. We had apple trees to climb. In the winter, we had big hills to toboggan down. We had a pond to swim in. We had lots of places to go and explore. And I remember spending hours lying in the ground looking for the four-leaf clover and going and collecting the wild strawberries and the raspberries that were around. My brother used to build rockets. Then he would shoot those rockets off. And then as a little sister, I was required to go chase after them and get them out of the burrs. That's just one of my torture stories (laughs) from my brother. It sounds like a great upbringing. You just have the one brother. I have a sister. 
she's in Germany now. She's a um, graphic artist by training and she's three, four years younger than me, but she moved to Germany well over a decade now and is running a restaurant with her husband and has fully immersed herself in the German culture. So you were the middle child growing up. Right. Making me the perfect of the three children. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. My sister would say the same. What schools did you attend? The very creatively named Aurora High School was my high school. It brought in kids from the rural areas. I was quite active when I was there in student politics and different things. Right from grade nine onwards, I was president of the students council and I got to be valedictorian of the graduating class. You had a colorful childhood, which is great. You were on student council and president, and that seems to have been a theme in your life that we will get into in a few moments. What drew you to the politics side of things? I texted my mother the other day. My mom is just about to turn 80. And I said, do you remember when you took me down to Toronto to participate in a political rally? And it was a march. Yeah. And I said, well, what was that about? And when was that? And this was the early 80s. So I would have been nine, 10 years old. And the world was really concerned about nuclear proliferation. And it was one of these major marches that was happening in global cities. And we participated in the one in Toronto. That stuck in my mind that you can get out there regardless of age. Any person could join and you could stand up and voice your opinion about something that was matter for the world. My mom embedded in me through that experience and through some women's marches, this sense of political engagement. She was always active in her own way when there were elections. She always was engaged politically and politically minded. And in our house with her and my dad, there were always really important conversations going on about the politics of the day. That seeped into my DNA, into my blood. So I got engaged in high school, not only in student politics, but also in provincial politics. And that has been a theme throughout my life. Thank you for sharing that. It's great to hear someone talking about their childhood when both parents have got conviction and exposing their kids to what is important to them. And I think that's wonderful. That's what my parents did, both of them, and my mom in that way. And with my dad, this was a time where women's rights were a big issue. And my dad is a feminist. He had daughters, me and the other one. And he taught us that we were equal to our brother and to all men and that we could do anything that they could. And we needed to do that as well. And so that was an important part of my development and my journey and my leaning in around politics and around leadership is the influence that both my parents had on me as a small child. So you graduated from high school and you ended up going to King's University College in London, which is a Catholic liberal arts university college affiliated with Western University. Why did you choose to go there? I chose King's because I had a friend whose older sister was at King's and raved about the school. And I went there because I didn't want to get lost in a big university. I wanted to have a community feel. That's always been important to me, and King's offered me that. It was a tremendous experience I had at King's. Some of the best memories I have in my life, two of my best girlfriends who I'm still friends with years later are from King's and were in my residence on my floor. It really made a mark for me at the time I chose it because of community, and I don't think that was a mistake. And I really valued the liberal arts education that I got there. Now, I did my undergraduate degree at Western as well, and I lived around the corner from King's College on Richmond. Were you someone who visited the Seeps, or were you more of a Chaucer's Pub person? Oh, I was totally a Seeps. <laughs> okay. Well, we can still be friends. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. A key turning point in my life was a conversation I had at the Seeps. It was my fourth year, and I had just lost the election for student council president for all of Western by 500 votes to engineer. I now have gotten over my hate of engineers. 
<laughs> my friend, his name is Doug Fry. Doug and I were having a beer in the seats and I said, what am I going to do now? You can uh, do your master's or my mom's hiring in Ottawa. So I weighed those choices and a few short weeks later, I found myself in Ottawa working for Hetty Fry. For those listeners who may not be familiar with the Seeps, that's the CPR Tavern, the CPR Hotel on the main drag Richmond in London, Ontario. And it has been a university haunt for longer than I've been alive. And I went in once when I was an undergrad and I, I can remember sitting with my friends. I'm from North Bay. And we looked around and I said, guys, we're the only people here wearing plaid shirts. <laughs> and they looked at me and they said, yeah. And I said, that's great. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, I've just given my eldest nephew a briefing on the seeps. He's moving off to Western in a couple of days' time, and he'll be a Huron. Good for him. So the tradition continues. That's right. It sounds like you had a really good, positive experience in London. So you graduated, you moved to Ottawa, I guess that was in 1996, and you served as a political advisor in the federal government. From what you've said, it sounds like that move was preordained. I guess it was. I didn't know it at the time. When I was talking with your producer, she really stumped me with one of her questions. And it comes back to where you're going here, because she said, what was the biggest mistake you made that turned out really well? What's your best mistake? Yeah. What I decided was the best mistake I made was when I was running at Western for student council president, it was the night before the election. And there were rules about where you could leave your political pamphlets and things. And one of the things they said was all of your material had to be out of lecture rooms and out of key places. Well, I happened to stumble into a certain large lecture room and discovered that one of my competitors had his material everywhere. I reported it. That was the stupidest thing I could have done because that guy was going to split the vote. So I would have won. Uh, <laughs> but then they removed him. And so I lost because the votes went to the engineer. That is the best mistake I ever made because as a result, I landed in Ottawa and here's my life two decades later. Wow, that's actually a cool story. That's got political strategy written all over it. Yeah, I would never be that dumb now. <laughs> <laughs> in the first few weeks that you were in Ottawa, you joined a baseball league and you met a few people and uh, one of them who became your first husband. That's right. I met a whole wonderful group of people through the Hill Beer League. I played first base. I was really good. The guys actually threw me the ball like they throw it to another guy. I could catch it. There you go. I met my first husband there. We dated for a number of years. We went on to get married. We had two beautiful daughters, one who's about to go off Queens and the other who is a phenomenal dancer. She's also the cook in my family. And so that was really terrific. That marriage was not meant to be. It was the starter marriage. I took a mulligan for the golfers who are listening and I remarried my second husband, Duncan. Duncan and I also go back to those early days in Ottawa because he too was a political person. He played on the baseball league, but I was the one who could catch the ball. I feel like things always work out the way they're supposed to. My first marriage and his first marriage, they were meant to be and those were important marriages and periods in of our lives. They gave us our children. We now look at our blended family and these four children and think, wow, this is incredible. So I think things work out the way they're supposed to. Absolutely. They always work out to sometimes not the way you expect it. Hi, it's Jim Wilson here. If you're a new listener to NGB Ideas, we'd like you to know this podcast is part of Next Great Big Ideas, Canada's Life Sciences Summit. NGBI is an in-person speakers event taking place at the Hamilton Convention Centre on the first Monday in October. The summit is also a national networking event for the Canadian life sciences community, and you don't have to pay a king's ransom to attend. For details and to purchase your tickets, please go to nextgreatbigideas.com. 
So you started on Parliament Hill, and you initially worked for Hetty Fry, who was Minister of State for Status of Women in Multiculturalism. We didn't touch on this before, but you did a history degree in women's history. And I did a history degree in Canadian history at Western. And I assume that given your degree and her portfolio, that that must have been a pretty cool job. It was a cool job. I mean, I was so lucky to have that opportunity and to work with Hetty. We worked on some really interesting files. One of the key ones that sticks out on my mind was on the sex trafficking of young girls and women. This was an issue back at that time that really was not well understood. And people didn't understand that this was a global problem. She wanted to do something about it. So she was all about raising awareness and educating people about this and trying to find champions and allies who could work with us on moving policy forward on this file. So that was really like awe-inspiring for me to see somebody say, we can do something about a big global issue and we're going to be part of this conversation. And then I got to play a small role in that. That was just fantastic. The government at that time, the Prime Minister was Jean Chrétien. He was an activist Prime Minister as well as the Prime Minister we have today in a different way and in his own different style. But it was also around that time where cabinet ministers and Hetty was part of it were really involved in things like LGBTQ and same-sex marriage. This was phenomenal to see this and to be part of it. Here I am in my young 20s taking on and being engaged in national policy issues. It gave me a real perspective for what can be done through the power of government and through the power of politics. And it merely heightened my awareness and deepened my passion for being Canadian. You were there for, I think, six years. And it sounds like you had a wonderful experience on a whole bunch of different levels. I did. I worked for Hetty when she was Secretary of State. And then I also worked with David Anderson, who was the Minister of Environment. He's also an Olympian for Canadian rowing. And he's from Victoria. And David really understood the environment. This was not just a generalist or a politician who'd been placed into a a department and said, manage this. He understood the environment at a deep, deep level and the policy issues. And it was when I was there in his office that we took on issues like climate change through the Kyoto Protocol, clean air, species at risk legislation, clean water, clean up of the tar sand, so many really important environmental issues. And he was constantly advocating one of the best, I think, environment ministers this country's ever had. But maybe I'm a little biased. I would agree with you on that. I'm glad to hear it. And I also, on the political level, I got to work with the prime minister. It was during one of our campaigns, and I was sent out and put on a team to set up the campaign events for the prime minister. We didn't know where we'd be one week to another. We were just all over different parts of Ontario. The May campaign team, the the airplane would say, okay, we need an event structured around this theme. Go find it. And that's what we did. That was really exciting. That gave me awesome experience in event management, in communications, in political thinking. We were turning on a dime. I really loved that. Wow. Again, you were there for about six years. And in 2002, you made a move to the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, where you were a senior policy advisor. And I guess it was at this point that you were initially exposed to the world of R&D. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've gotten some of it during my time in the environment minister's office. But moving over to CIHR, it was, let's get to know the life sciences and health research. In fact, one of the first files I worked on at CIHR was on embryonic stem cell research. This was a very topical in 2002 onwards. There was government working on legislation relevant to stem cell research, the Assisted Human Reproduction Act. And I worked with Alan Bernstein on some of his appearances before committee, both in the House and in the Senate. In fact, I met one of the initial employees of the brand new stem cell network at that time, Barb Beckett. She was the one who exposed me to the NCE system and taught me about stem cell research. For our listeners, the NCE system is? The Networks of Centers of Excellence. This was a government program that lasted about 20 some odd years, and it was designed to support research networks across the country. And that's where 
my organization, the Stem Cell Network, got its start. I'd like to back up for a second because you moved out of government into this organization. What prompted the move? I was getting married and politics was a little unstable for someone who wanted to start a family and be married. That's a good reason. Pretty much as simple as that, I think. I wanted something a little bit more stable and CIHR provided me with that opportunity. And when I went into CIHR, I went into the communications group there where I provided communications and government relations support. In that role, you kind of became a, a translator between researchers and government decision makers. So everybody on both sides of the table knew what the other one was trying to say. Is that correct? You betcha. Scientists and politicians just talk past each other. That's when I really took on the translation role, where I needed to spend time with the scientists who are working within the CIHR system when they needed to talk to government officials or politicians and explain to them how a politician would be viewing or thinking about an issue. And I did that with the politicians, too, and with the minister's office and ministerial staff so that they understood the perspective of the scientists. I could be trusted on both ends because I came out of a political system. So politically, they trusted me within CIHR. I was theirs. I was part of CIHR. So they trusted me there. I was able to say, okay, well, this is really what's going on and why they're asking this and why it's happening that way. Perhaps we need to think about this approach or that approach. So you were able to ask some blunt questions without people getting offended. Yep. And that's important. Yeah. So in October 2009, you left the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to work at the Council of Canadian Academies. And this is an organization with which I am absolutely unfamiliar. So before we talk about your time there, I would appreciate you explaining what it's about. In the United States, the organization that the CCA is modeled on is called the National Academies of Science. And the National Academies of Science, like the CCA, work with experts to produce expert-based, evidence-based publications, reports that are on certain policy issues. They are not prescriptives. They don't have a political or economic angle. Businesses aren't involved. Lobbyists aren't involved. This is an activity that is meant to give a neutral evidence base, a diagnosis of what a situation is, so that policymakers and others can go away and think about, if we understand this as the diagnosis, what's our prescription? And so this is an incredibly valuable organization in this country. The work the CCA has produced over its time has been extraordinary for improving policy and regulatory decision making. You don't see it in everyday headlines because it's really in depth, but a policymaker will go away and look at what's being said and departments will digest that and then come back and then maybe offer, here's where we need to go next. It just yesterday, I was on the phone, both the current CEO of the CCA and also an expert panel member who sat on two or three of their expert panels. And we were talking about a report that they did a few years ago on somatic gene editing. And it really helped to lay out the issues and challenges for us as we go forward and think about gene therapy development where the government needs to come to play so that we can have accessible and affordable gene therapies in this country because the science is taking us there. That expert panel report helped to describe the situation, give the contact, and talk about where the opportunities and the challenges lie. So there's a wealth of these reports that the CCA has done. They're invaluable, and I would encourage people to take a look at them. They cover everything from environmental issues to social issues to health issues. Thank you for that overview. I, I appreciate it. And you've piqued my curiosity. I'm guessing this experience also helped build your understanding of planning and policy development and governance, and I guess what's important to running an organization. Absolutely. Fundamental for my professional development. I was recruited out of CIHR to come and be the inaugural director of communications for CCA. 
So off I went as a young mom, excited to try to balance it all and do it all. Successfully burned myself out. That's another story. What I learned there as a, a member of the senior management team is about governance, about the importance of benchmarking and metrics. I learned about the importance of policy development and where evidence plays a key role in policy development, that it can't all be ideologically based and we need the facts to help shape our country and where we go. It gave me a wonderful opportunity to work with experts across this country in so many different fields. It was Peter Nicholson who hired me for that position. Peter is well-known expert on innovation. He's retired, but you still see him coming back into the fray from time to time. And Peter has a great perspective on R&D and innovation. It was an honor to get to work with him to understand the state of R&D, to understand the state of innovation in this country. And also with all of these tables of experts who really understood the depths of different issues. It was a fascinating time. So you were with the Council of Canadian Academies for about five and a half years until May of 2015, and you left to start your own government relations firm. If you don't mind my asking, what prompted that move? There was leadership change going on at CCA. There was a divorce, and there were small children. All of these things led me to think, I need to make some changes, and so that's what I did. So stepping away, I needed time for myself and for my daughters. I needed to remind myself that I could stand on my own two feet. And what a way to do that than by launching your own company. And with a father who was an entrepreneur who left the church with $300 in his pocket, my brother who started a company from scratch, I thought, okay, there's got to be an entrepreneurial gene at me somewhere. So let's give it a go. So I did that for a year and a half or two. But for me, I found working on my own, it did not scratch the social community itch I have. So I needed to go back. There was also a change in the federal government in November of 2015 and a rather significant change in the direction in support of the Canadian science sector at the federal level. And in early 2016, you joined Stem Cell Network as Director of Communications and External Affairs. And that seems like a natural transition from where you were going to where this was heading. Someone within my network who does government relations and new people at Stem Cell Network at that time, they said, look, we've just gotten this injection of $6 million and we got a reboot and we need some help to do it. Do you know anybody? This fella in my network, he called me and he said, would this be of interest? Because he saw the connection with my health research background and my background working with experts the communications piece. I guess I owe him a good bottle of wine. (laughs) So I went into the network and I thought this is going to be a quiet little job and quickly discovered, I think within about 48 hours, that it wasn't going to be a quiet little job and it was actually going to be two or three jobs combined into one. If I recall correctly, there were rumors around that time about the organization being in some difficulty as well. What was it that helped turn that corner for the organization? There were a few things about what helped turn the corner for the stem cell network. The science being number one. Stem cell and regenerative medicine research are the future of healthcare. I see that every day now. That was the absolutely fundamental thing that was critical to the stem cell network continuing on. Secondly, it was an understanding by the newly appointed science minister at that time, Kirsty Duncan, who championed the stem cell network because she understood the value and the importance of stem cell research and regenerative medicine. That championship of hers did not fall on deaf ears. And it was a senior level official in the Department of Finance who is now retired, Richard Botham, who also believed in where stem cell and regenerative medicine research was going. Combined, having those types of powerful champions allowed the stem cell network to graduate successfully out of the NCE program into a new chapter, into a new day, where it set us on a ground to become a truly national not-for-profit that's absolutely thriving. 
We've had lots of bumps along the road around our funding, but the bottom line is that it's understood how fundamental this space is for our economic and health of our country and our citizens. The government has continually shown trust in us and belief in this space and where it will take us. Hi, it's Drew again with a reminder that the NGB Ideas podcast and the next Great Big Ideas Summit have been created to raise awareness and financial support for McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton, Ontario. MCH provides critical pediatric care for families from Niagara Falls through Hamilton, Waterloo Region, and, and north to Georgian Bay. If you are able and interested in providing financial support for an organization, we hope you will consider McMaster Children's Hospital. To learn more about MCH, please go to hamiltonhealthsciences.ca slash mcmaster hyphen children's hyphen hospital. Thanks for listening. Now let's get back to our show. We've been now talking about Stem Cell Network for a little bit, and I didn't ask you to explain for our listeners exactly what it is and what its mission is. If you could shed some light on that, I'd appreciate it. We're a national not-for-profit. We are an organization of researchers, and we support training of the next generation. We partner with companies, with charities, with hospitals, all in moving regenerative medicine therapies and technologies forward. So they get to patients. They get to my mom and your sister and the guy who lives across the road. And the great thing about stem cells is it's a cross-cutting technology. It's a living technology that's in all of us. We use that power of stem cells and our understanding of it to come up with therapies that will repair, regrow, regenerate, restore function to tissues and to organs and to cells so that we can live a more healthier life. Our mission is really about bringing forward those therapies to patients. We have an amazing set of clinicians, researchers, bioengineers, bioethicists, and scholars who all make up the Stem Cell Network. It's a really wonderful community. Indeed it is. And we've had the privilege of speaking with a few members of that community, including Michael May and and Mitch Sibilotti and, and others. Your organization is funded by the federal government. We are. Do you have any other sources of funding? So the way that we work is is that our researchers bring partners in on their research projects. We use the federal funding as leverage to bring in partner support. Companies will come in and they will offer in-kind or cash support for specific projects. Hospitals will, university institutions, charities will as well. Let me tell you a little story. We have this really great guy, Tim Keefe. Tim is out at UBC, and he's a stem cell biologist, and he has a really dynamic, forward-thinking lab. Tim's focus is type 1 diabetes and how to apply cell therapies to the treatment of type 1 diabetes. So he partnered up with a company that's part of our network called Aspect Biosystems. Aspect Biosystems is in the business of 3D printing and bioprinting. So what they did is Tim and Aspect put together a project plan that would see one of Aspect's proprietary printers placed into Tim's lab and a couple of their people go over to Tim's lab and a couple of his postdocs and technicians in his lab would work with those people at Aspect on a specific set of experiments that would help to develop a data package that Aspect was trying to build. They applied to Stem Cell Network for funding for this. It went through our scientific peer review. 500000 was allocated and awarded for the project. And the data that they were able to build from that project was at the heart of an agreement that came to be recently with Aspect and Novo Nordisk. That partnership is worth $2.6 billion. And their partnership, it's initially going to focus on developing a bioprinted tissue therapeutic that will help to maintain glucose levels without needing immunosuppression. So that's a really big deal. If this works out, that's pretty transformative for people with diabetes. It's a game-changing technology. 
this is how we partner. So we use the money the federal government gives us to leverage, to build out our research projects, to bring in companies and others who are going to be receptors and users of that technology to then develop it and to secure big wins for the health of Canadians. What a great story. Thank you for sharing that. If there is a a private investor or a family institute that's listening to this podcast and they're interested in the work that you are helping fund and would like to partner with you, is that opportunity there? They just need to reach out and give us a call. My email is all over the internet. And it'll be in in the summary of the podcast. I'd like to go down another path here. It strikes me that you're one of those people in the Canadian life sciences community that has a glimpse into the future before any of us do. You're talking to startups and academic researchers. In my mind, that's an enviable position. It's really cool. I love this position to be in and to see what's coming and what's in the pipeline. A couple of days ago. I'm talking to one of these incredibly talented women within our network, Nika Shakiba. And Nika is out at the University of British Columbia, and she studied with Peter Zanstra. Then she was off to MIT for a little while. Now she's been recruited back to Canada and is based with her own lab. So I said, Nika, what are you working on? What's going on these days? She told me this story about this game that her and her lab have created. She has a friend that she met, Maria Abu Shaker, and Maria is based in Toronto. They're at a symposium together that was put on by Medicine by Design and the Stem Cell Network. And they happened at the end of this to be waiting at the subway stop and they got talking. And Maria said to Nika that her postdoc and her work was in game theory. And it was designed to understand how birds behave, the mafia behavior of birds. I didn't know there were actually mafias of birds. So that was new. Anyway, it sparked Nika's imagination. Long story short, the two Nika calls Maria and she says, look, we're waiting for all of our lab supplies and things to come. Would you mind teaching me and my trainees about game theory? We want to build a game that's designed around how cells operate and function at the early embryonic stage. Because what Nika tells me is is that cells are actual bullies. They're not all nice to each other, but they're bullies. So they wanted to create this survival of the fittest type of game. They learned Python and they designed this multi-realm game where the players are the cells who exist during embryonic development. The cells get points for their contribution in creating an organism. To get points, you have to work together to build the right-sized organism. She says it's called collective risk because the fate of the players depends on one another. But what you'll see is is that the weaker cells get pushed out, the lazy cells can hide for a while, and then there's more dominant cells. But if those dominant cells add too much progeny, that's a bad thing. Actually need a collective working together to create a proper organism. And the question about this is, is this just about evolutionary development or is there something else going on there? They're using this game now to answer partly that question, but to also understand the rules of what governs a cellular community. Because if we understand how cells work and operate with each other and what ones survive, then this will have immense application for developing durable, efficient, cost-effective cell therapies, which is a big issue because right now we're all worried about the cost of developing these therapies. We have to learn how these cells work together or fight each other. We also want to know what ones will be fit enough to stand their ground and do the job they're supposed to do in the body. Once we have this understanding, then we can start to code the DNA in the cell. And if we are able to program those cells with using their DNA, then we can get them to repair damage or restore function and for the treatment of disease and illness. So if you think about CAR-T therapy for cancer, that's what we're doing today with CAR-T therapy. And in fact, we've got researchers in our community right now who are looking at how we cloak cells to evade the immune system so that we can treat things like autoimmune diseases such as diabetes. One day, what's going to happen is 
we're going to be uploading cell therapies to the body like you upload apps to your phone. It's really cool to think about it. So I love that that's where the science is going. But this also shows me what the power of the stem cell network is. Here we have two phenomenal women from different sides of the country with very different expertise who came together because the stem cell network and others created opportunities for them to get to know each other. And that synergy has then allowed them to collaborate on something really leading edge. I never thought that the next cell therapy might come out of a computer model. It just blows my mind. Thank you for sharing that. As you're describing how that serendipitous meeting happens, I think the underlying message to the younger listeners of this podcast might be get out of your lab and go to industry events like Next Race Big Ideas and say hello and ask, as Ella Court Smith, our guest last week, mentioned, she's the chief strategy officer and co-founder of Erica Biotech in Ottawa. She very correctly pointed out networking is about asking what you can do for others, not what they can do for you. It is so true. I know, Ella, we both, in fact, took your sponsor, Ed Mare's executive leadership program together during COVID. So I got to know Ella really well and consider her a good friend. I remember one of the first conversations I had with her. She said to me, so how can I help you? We're lucky to have her and you as part of the team. Again, as we're chatting, I'm thinking, do we have the infrastructure and the, and the talent pipeline to fully realize the potential that you're talking about? It's a challenge. You know, if you're talking to Rob Henderson over from BioTalent, she'll tell you that we need 30,000 plus highly skilled people to work in the bioeconomy. We have an opportunity to build up that workforce. For the stem cell network, it's one of the key things that we do. We've trained over 6,000 in the last two decades, and we're on track to get to 10,000 by the end of this decade. We do this with an eye to people having the career skills, the knowledge, the technical skills they need to be able to work in the life sciences, in stem cell research or regenerative medicine, both in industry and within academia. From a biomanufacturing perspective, which is also going to be really important as we think about access and affordability to cell and gene therapies, we need a huge set of talent to work there. Some of those people will come out of the stem cell network and some will come from other places. So we need to look at immigration and our immigration system and think about how easy is it for us to attract immigrants to this country who have the skills we need to work in our labs. We also need to look at how do we reach back to the expats who are working or training in institutions like MIT and bring them back to Canada. A couple of weeks ago, I was in a meeting with the Consul General's office in Boston, and I had the opportunity to meet this really nice fella. They call him the Prime Minister. He's an MIT trainee working on his PhD, and he's a Canadian. And he told me that there are over 400 MIT Canadians. He says many of them don't know how to come back to Canada. They don't know where the jobs are. They don't know how to access them. They don't know how to set themselves up. And we're like, well, we can help you with that. And there's many organizations that can do that. So what we actually, in my mind, need to do over the next decade is think about these major institutions in the United States where Canadians go to trade and systematically, strategically reach back out to them and say, come back to Canada, here's where the jobs are. They're at Aspect, they're at Notch, they're at Blue Rock Therapeutics, they're in this lab and that lab. We need a strategy around re-attracting that talent back to this country. A lot of them want to come home and that's what Adam told me. I hope the right people are listening to those comments, which I agree wholeheartedly with. Hi, it's Jim Wilson here. If you're enjoying today's podcast, we'd like you to do us a favor and tell your friends about us. Share a post on social with the hashtags NGB Ideas and NGBI. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at NGB Ideas. We'd also appreciate you joining us in person at the Next Great Big Ideas Summit this October at the Hamilton Convention Center. For details on our speakers and the event, please go to Next greatbigideas.com. 
You've been president and CEO of Stem Cell Network now for about a year and a half, and I'm wondering if this job is turning out to be what you expected. I love my job. I get to meet the coolest people and work with the coolest people in a sector that is growing by leaps and bounds. It is mission-driven. It is fun, and it is challenging. I couldn't have asked for a better job. And all my science teachers are currently scratching their heads saying, how did this happen? (laughs) I love it. The Stem Cell Network is just an incredible place to be, and I'm honored to get to serve this community. And parents of every liberal arts student across the country are applauding you for giving hope to their kids. What is the biggest challenge you face on a daily basis? I think for me, it's balancing work and personal life. I'm in the sandwich generation. While we've been here talking, I've had texts from my mom and dad asking me for things. I've had my daughter dancing at the door, trying to distract me. I have a sick dog who's suffering from bad allergies. So those sorts of things combined with the daily demands of growing an organization is my biggest challenge. How do I keep balance and how do I take care of myself? And right now, for instance, my body is quite mad at me as I'm having some lower disc degenerative issues from sitting at the computer too long. My trainer, Allie, he's been giving me the gears about the right stretches and getting up and moving around. Balancing all of that is my biggest personal challenge. Let's turn that question around. What's the thing you look forward to most about your job when you wake up in the morning? There's so many things. I think it's connecting with my colleagues. I have really wonderful colleagues and I consider them friends as well. We work together collaboratively. I don't have to have all the answers and they don't have to have all the answers, but we just work through it together. I enjoy being able to be honest and upfront with them, um, to share with them, to work through challenges and to talk about what it is that we can do that will make the community better and how do we do that. We're constantly innovating and thinking and pushing the boundaries for the stem cell network. So I love to work with people like that who are just mission driven and are just as passionate as I am. That's an enviable position to be in. You and I do not have science backgrounds. Are there any skills you've had to learn for your role? A smile and nod and go, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Write down the term and then go Google it. It's an interviewing skill. When I'm talking to researchers, like I was talking to Nika the other day, I said, okay, don't give me the science lecture on this. So let's talk about this from a lay perspective. And I'm an informed, intelligent person, I hope. And so I need to be able to interview the scientists so that I can understand what they're doing and where they're going. And then I've also had to teach scientists about how to do that kind of communication with policy and government people as well and with media as well. So that's really been an important skill set for me to build up over the years. I just have to have the confidence to lean in and say, what? What do you mean by that? And be okay with that and get them to go back and repeat it. I very often have felt like a bit of a fraud and an outlier because I'm not science trained, but that has also been my superpower. Absolutely. You're thankfully one of the many women who now occupy leadership roles in the Canadian life sciences community. The idea principles of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility are being adopted with increasing frequency, and it's long overdue and great to see. I would appreciate your thoughts on how far we've come as an industry and how far we have yet to go. We've got a long way to go, but we have progressed. Back around 2011 or 12, I was working on an expert panel report that was looking about um, the challenges women face in science. It was astonishing to hear about the sexism, about the rampant dismissal of women in the lab at the boardroom table that had happened throughout the careers of a number of the women who sat on that expert panel. Today, we're more sensitive to it and more aware of it, but there's still a long way to go. I know that I have colleagues who think they're very progressive and treat women equally, but then the next minute they're mansplaining to you. So there's still work to be done. 
I have the stem cell network and as a woman leader feel very passionately about I have an important role to play when it comes to our governance I make sure that I'm looking for EDI I want experts I want people who come from diverse backgrounds to come from diverse experiences right across the board at my boardroom table because that helps me get to better decision making I believe that we need to have women's voices. We need to have diverse voices on every panel we sit on. We need to have that reflected and how we train the next generation to think about this innately. My husband, Duncan, a number of years ago, he was putting together a table of people in his field for an event, and he's in the defense field, very male dominated. And I said, oh, who have you got? Who's going? And he listed them all off. I'm like, those are all white men. What are you doing? He's like, what? He hadn't even clue that that's what he'd done. I said, the way that you elevate and you bring women and you bring people from different cultures and backgrounds in is you include them in your events, at your tables, and in your conversation. And you must do this very thoughtfully and systematically until that muscle is built. Ever since then, he's always done that because his wife gave him the gears. What I'm really proud of at the Stem Cell Network is, is that we are funding women at the same rate that they are applying to us. And the rates that they're applying to us is increasing. Wow, that's great to hear. Our board for a long time was predominantly women. It's not the old boys network that maybe some had thought it was years ago. It's a dynamic place. And people like Mika and Maria, they're the future. I'm really excited about that. Beyond the industry itself, do you think there's a similar issue around treatment that we need to address? Absolutely. When it comes to going into a room with other executives, there's a good chance I might be the only woman in that room. My voice is the last to be heard, even though they may not say it. But you also see things like if I put an idea on at the table, it may get dismissed or not picked up upon. If someone else who might be of a different gender puts that idea on the table, it does get picked up on. And then you sit back and go, really? I just said that three minutes ago. So it happens. It's unconscious bias. We don't even know we're doing it. It's a human nature thing, and we have to be conscious about it and think hard about what we're doing and how we're responding. It's still explicit across our society. We do have a long way to go. I appreciate you outlining it, and it's a reminder to me, and I'm sure many of our listeners, that, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm going to pay closer attention. That's all it is. I don't really believe that people mean to do that to any other person. It's just unconscious bias, and you just have to be very self-aware and in the moment of the conversations you're having, and then that muscle will come. All of us have these biases but we just need to think about how do we address them personally? And then how do we integrate and encourage a culture that inspires EDI or idea? I'd like to turn from that and ask one of my favorite questions, which we touched on earlier. And that is about your best mistake as a reminder that sometimes what you think is the worst thing to happen turns out to be the best consequence. Absolutely. It's so true. I was devastated when I lost that election and it was so close, but it turned out perfectly. I was devastated when I went through my divorce and what that did for me and for my kids, but it's turned out so well. And I'm so lucky to have had a second chance at love and at that marriage. When we're at our lowest, usually the highs are not too far away. So when it's going really badly, don't be too low. And when it's going really well, don't be over the moon. Just try to keep a steady keel. That's right. Like Ted Lasso says, believe. I need to watch that show. You're not going to watch Ted Lasso? Why am I even talking to you? <laughs> you must watch Ted Lasso. Ted Lasso and Star Trek. You're a Trekkie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you betcha. Okay. I will admit to being a former Trekkie. Let's put me down as being a future Ted Lasso fan. I have another favorite question I like asking people and speaking about highs and lows. We all make mistakes and we all have big wins. Do you have a big mistake in particular other than the one that you've mentioned and perhaps a big win that you've experienced professionally? And if so, can you share those situations with us and what you learned from both? 
Okay, I'll start with the big win. And some people who know me would say my big win was when the stem cell network secured in 2021, a more than doubling of our budget, because that was a game changer for the network. We went from 6 million to 15 million annually. And that was a hard, hard push to get that. So some people would say that was the big win that I would reference, but it's not. The big win I would reference was pushing the government to allow the stem cell network to fund early stage clinical trials. Because clinical trials mean that innovative therapies are getting to patients. And I felt that big win when I was at one of our Tilla McCullough meetings. And we had this young fella up on stage who'd been part of one of our clinical trials. His name's Tyler Rabbi. Tyler was in his early 20s. And just before he started university, he was not feeling well. And he was diagnosed with an aggressive blood cancer. They thought Tyler might die. All of the therapies, they weren't working. And he had a doctor that just kept pushing and pushing. And he found this clinical trial that the stem cell network was now funding through Guy Sauvigeau. He was enrolled in it. And within a few months, they started to see a change in him. He recovered fully from that cancer. Years later, he now runs a PR for and he's got a great future. And he came and he spoke at our TMM meetings about his journey. And I thought, if I hadn't pushed the government to let us fund clinical trials, I don't know that Tyler would be here telling us about when he got to kiss his girlfriend again. That was my big win. That's why I do this job, so that people get a second chance and a healthier life. Thank you for sharing that. What a wonderful story. What are my other big mistakes? There's so many. I make mistakes daily. To join the club. Constantly saying sorry to people. I think one of the biggest mistakes I've made is I've missed out on some opportunities because I didn't have the self-confidence and I didn't lean in when I should have. Those opportunities, who knows where they would have taken me. I didn't feel like I was smart enough to pursue a master's degree or a PhD because I have a learning disability If I'd had the confidence and I believed what my dad told me at the time, today I'd probably be a psychologist. A very different route. I let that learning disability for a long time define me and hold me back. Now I don't let it hold me back. I embrace it and I know how to work with it and I hope I can work with others who also have learning disabilities so that they can excel and give to the world in the way they want to. May I ask what that disability is? It kind of comes in two parts. There's an auditory processing piece. So the way that I hear sound and then repeat sound is different. So that's really impaired my ability to learn another language. Additionally, I am not strong with numbers. It's about how I perceive and I understand numbers and being able to think in abstract. It's very challenging. That's really at the crux of it is how it comes out. I have a good joke with our CFO. I said, you do the numbers, I do the works. Life's a team sport. And then it comes to tax time and I get her and my husband together and they sort me out. I'm on that program. (laughs) Yeah. So it's just about a processing of numbers issue and then it's a processing of language issue. The wiring's just not quite right. Well, you know what? From our conversation, I would never have picked up on that. I really do appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. We all have bucket lists personally and professionally and I'm wondering what is on yours. Let's start with your professional list first. Professionally, what's on my bucket list is to get this country to have a national science strategy that's coherent and people will rally around. And personally, I need to do some more travel. I got to launch these four kids and get some good old travel done. How old are they now? The youngest is 15. My eldest is 18, off to Queens. My stepson, who's the youngest, he's 18 and off to Queens. And my eldest stepson is 20 and is in his third year of journalism at Carleton. Oh, wow. Lots going on in your households over the next couple of weeks. Stem cell research is on fire at the moment. Where do you see the organization in five, 10 years? Continuing to be a leading and driving force in this country and I hope around the world. With us and the members in the network, the researchers, the trainees, producing really impactful, valuable therapies and technologies and generating the discoveries that we need to build our understanding of stem cell research and regenerative medicine. 
And I hope that the stem cell network will be at the heart of driving that research forward, that will be the powerhouse organization for making sure that the research is happening in a really robust way so that it can be taken up and commercialized by all of those great commercialization engines that are out there. I look forward to reading more about that in the coming months and years. That leads me to my final question, which we end each of our interviews with. What is the next great big idea on your horizon? This is the idea. I can't wait for Star Trek meet regenerative medicine. <laughs> Mika, I'm putting my bets on her. I want those cell therapies as apps that we inject into the human body, just like we see on Star Trek. That's my next great big idea. I want that to become the reality. That's super cool. Now, you're saying that partly tongue-in-cheek, but as we discussed earlier, it's really cool what they are contemplating, and it could play a role in the next generation of therapies. It will play a role in the next generation of therapies, and it is really cool. The one story I didn't tell you was about a woman in Toronto, Stephanie Prox. She's another early career researcher. She's working on a cell-based pacemaker for people who have heart disease. So instead of getting an electronic pacemaker, you will have a cell-based pacemaker. That's the future. Those are the next big ideas. It's personalized medicine. It's these really novel technologies that will come from our living cells. Thank you so much for your time. I know that you're very busy. I look forward to meeting you at Next Great Big Ideas in October in Hamilton. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on stage. And thanks again for your time today. This has been a treat. This has just been terrific, and no one ever lets me talk about myself for this long. And <laughs> so I don't have to go to the therapist now for a while. You can save me some money, so I appreciate that. This has been terrific, and I just want to congratulate you on the podcast and on the upcoming conference. It's so meaningful what's behind it and why you're doing it for McMaster Children's Hospital. It's just a great initiative, and so I'm really pleased to be part of it. That's very kind of you to say. Thank you so much. That was Kate Murray, President and CEO of the Stem Cell Network. If you'd like to find out more about Kate and SCN, please go to stemcellnetwork.ca. If you'd like to follow Kate on social, you can find her at Kate underscore Murray one, and you can follow her team at Stem Cell Network. We are also on social at NGB Ideas, and you can find me at Lab Occupier. Thanks to Tisha Prasad for researching and editing today's show. If you'd like to email me, my address is jwilson at Leonard, that's L-E-N-N-A-R-D dot com. Thanks so much for listening.